talking about Jehoshaphat today. And um, Jehoshaphat was king following his father, um, which was so uh, prevalent. Um, they didn't have a four-year election cycle like we do. Uh, they were, it was family. But of course, we have two kingdoms, Israel north, Judah to the south. And um, Israel was the northern kingdom. How many good kings in the northern kingdom? None. N-U-N or N-O-N-E? Zero? All right, thank you. How many good kings in the southern kingdom? Any, any guesses? Five. I believe it was eight. So there's about 20 in each one. But the northern kingdom didn't have very many good kings. <clears throat> Jehoshaphat was a good king in Judah. And uh, in 1 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 17 through 21, those chapters tell of Jehoshaphat becoming king and what he did to train the people. Um, these chapters tell of the king. We can read of the heart of Jehoshaphat in chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed the troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken, or Asa. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals. But sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments, not according to the acts of Israel. Therefore the Lord established a kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat. And he had riches and honor and abundance, and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and the wooden images from Judah. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but in the paths. Psalm 1. Uh, Jehoshaphat did that. As we continue reading, um, Jehoshaphat sent out men to teach all of Judah the book of the law of the Lord. And I want you to listen as we go through what Jehoshaphat experienced how the people acted. But Jehoshaphat just became so powerful. Um, verse 10 in chapter 17 says, And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so that they did not, they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was allied slightly with Israel, because it said that he, by marriage, was tied into the king up there, and his name was... Ahab, and his wife was Jezebel. Evil, evil, evil people. <laughs> anyway, uh, chapter 17 uh, tells, uh, or 18 tells a lot about what happens with him and Ahab. But I don't have time to go through all that because we got a lot of ground to cover. Jehoshaphat was... Um, Powerful, and if you read the numbers of soldiers that he brought together, it's amazing. Uh, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. And after it names them who are under different um, leaders, it also says, and others. So he had a lot. So as time went on, the people of Moab and Amnon and Mount Seir came against Jehoshaphat. And what was the people's response? The people that Jehoshaphat was ruling in Judah. Verse, this is chapter 20, and forgive me, I guess this is one of the passes you can do if you're going to be up here speaking. I'm going to read a lot. It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon, and others with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, which are in Haman, Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now listen, in verse 3. And Jehoshaphat did what? He feared. And then he set himself to 
Seek the Lord and proclaim the fast to all, all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And, the, and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Je Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. So Jehoshaphat was afraid. He proclaimed a fast. Judah gathered. That's the response of the people. They came together. This is what amazed me when I read this, that Judah gathered. Can you imagine? Minnesota gathered. And then to ask help from the Lord. To seek the Lord. That's Judah. To me, that's the whole nation came together. Um, it doesn't tell us how many. It doesn't say that it was uh, half the population. It just said Judah. And then Jehoshaphat has a prayer. I love this prayer. It's one of those that gives me Jesus bumps. Jehoshaphat's prayer starting in verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, it doesn't say he prayed, but this is a prayer. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to your descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if any, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now... Here are the people of Ammon, Moabite, Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you gave to us to inherit. He's kind of testy, isn't he? O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor, we, nor, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Did it sound like Jehoshaphat was kind of whining through that prayer? You could take it that way. Was he remembering the works of the Lord in that prayer? Do you have a list of works that the Lord has done in your life that you can look back on? Mile markers, a stone, uh, a stake in the ground. I love the mile marker at the intersection of 71 and 28 out here. Mile marker 167. The interstate, when you go down to um, the metro, where it crosses 15, mile marker, exits 167A, 167B. St. Rose, County Road 167. A little town out western Minnesota, Wendell, population 167. Do you know what the railroad marker is for the mile marker on the railroad by Wendell? 167. Man, that was my wrestling weight when I was a senior in high school. That's why I love that mile marker. That's a marker. I don't aspire to be 167, but that's a mile marker. But in my life, do I have markers. And Jehoshaphat, in my mind, nailed it with these. 
And there's other prayers that are just as good in effect that they can be preached on, but this is one I like. <clears throat> All of Judah with their little ones, verse 13, and their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Excuse me, there's a word that they called expectorate. <laughs> it means spit. I may spit when I read this part because I love this. <clears throat> Any of these movies like Braveheart where he goes up and down challenging his soldiers into this fight. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And they said that they actually brought armies together in the land where this was filmed. I don't know where it was filmed, but the guy who... Uh, who uh, produced the movie, <laughs> said that after Mel Gibson rides up and down the thing, these guys just start going, yeah, we'll kill him, we'll kill him. You know, they weren't supposed to do that. They got so fired up, they're all excited, wearing their kilts out there and their fake swords and spears and stuff. So they definitely were in the mood. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon the Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. Oh my, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do very good here. The son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattathan, Mattathiah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, to me, this is the ultimate pep talk. Listen, is this too hot? If it's, I don't mean to hurt anyone's ears, but listen, all you Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Woo! Let's go! Now! We're going to fight! God's going to win this battle for us. He said, you don't have to fight. So what did Jehoshaphat do? <clears throat> Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. There was a posture. I believe he was face down on the ground. He was humbled. Something I'm not real good at. Verse 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. These were the tribes and peoples who, that was their job. They were the musicians, the worship leaders. They were the singers. That's what they did. So they rose early in the morning, went out in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and those who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. The band went before the battle. The band before the armed men. It's just like, <laughs> this isn't the right word, but the craziness of going around Jericho. No weapons. Let's send the band first. <laughs> I'll lead from behind. You go. Take the spears with your bass drum. <clears throat> now when they begin to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moabite, Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon... And Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. When they had made an end of all the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. The battle was fought. The enemy killed the enemy. Judah did not have to fight at all. Three days to bring the spoil in from these armies. Three days. There was a massacre. And they didn't lose a man, nothing. 
Verse 28, so they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and the fear of the God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. That's pretty intimidating, is it not? They didn't even send the army out. They sent out a band, and they all were killed. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. I love that result. I love that prayer. I love the answer that God brought to them. Let's go to the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. And you're probably very familiar with Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. God had told the people, the, the disciples, wait. So that's what they were doing. They were waiting. In verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, a mighty wind, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter has his sermon. How many are saved after Peter's sermon? Do you remember? About 3,000. Okay, let me stand corrected. There's a lot. 3,000 or 5,000? Okay. I better be better at my fact checking. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go through all of Peter's his, uh, his response and his, and his preaching. I want to say we're familiar with that. But verse 36 of chapter 2, Acts chapter, 30, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Peter's wrapping up. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the promise and the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, so as many as the Lord our God will call. 3,000, verse 41. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized in that day. About 3,000 were added to them. Thank you. All right, so Peter, he preaches, and he calls them to repent. How often do we ask someone to repent. And Kathy and I talked about this a while back. I am very slow to confess my sin in my prayer. And in order to have things clear between me and the Lord, I have to be confessing my sin. And I have to be right before him. So he calls them to repent and be baptized. The book of Acts is a transitional book. It's a history book and it's transitional. The church is formed. This is the first that the church is formed. So there's things that happen there that we don't see happening here. But you know what? With our pastor's resignation and the, the last years that our world has gone through, um, we are in a church planting ministry, regardless of where you are. People's habits have changed. We made it too easy for people to sit at home and, and, and watch a service without coming out. And if that's the only way you can do it, I'm not condemning you. We've made it easy for people who are unable to get out. But I'd love to see you here if you would be able to. <clears throat> So the confession, the repentance, and receiving Christ as Savior and the Holy Spirit is in the church. It's new. It's a transitional time. Our church is in a transition period. I'm going to read verses 40 through 42 again. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Do we live in a perverse generation? We are to be light. We are to make a difference where we're at. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. 
and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. When Pastor Joel first came, he introduced a book called Autopsy of a Deceased Church by Tom S. Rayner. And Tom Rayner is a, a consultant, and uh, um, he has worked with hundreds and hundreds of churches. I have to get the book. I'm not very well set here. <clears throat> What I found interesting is that uh, Pastor Daryl Fryer, who is our state rep, had put this on Facebook that this was a book that he had read, Autopsy of a Deceased Church. I'm not saying our church is deceased, but there's a chapter in here that I want to dwell on. If we take a look at verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Tom Rayner, in this book, goes back and interviews, interviews people who are in churches that have closed. And he asks them questions, and he tabulated this data. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit here. He asks the question, describe your prayer times. Dorothy spoke next. Oh, yes, she said, we prayed for a while together as a church. We had Wednesday night meal and prayer time. Then we were larger. When we were larger, we were able to afford cooks to prepare our meals. So if we lost members, we had to go to potluck. That was a shame because I never knew what other people were bringing. I remember one night we had 12 vegetables and one dessert. No meat, no bread. It was a shame. She'd gotten off topic, so I guided her back. Tell me about the prayer time on Wednesday night, I asked. Well, she begins somewhat thoughtfully. Carl would pass out a prayer list to us all. I interrupted since I did not. Carl, she continued. Oh, Carl was a deacon, and he had a copy machine in his office. We used to have a church secretary to type and copy those. We had to let her go because we couldn't afford her. Carl just kind of picked up the slack there. You know, it's a sad day we no longer had a full-time secretary. That was a shame. Again, I asked her to return to the topic of prayer. That's pretty much it, she said. Carl would pass out the prayer list. One person would have the blessing, pray for those on the list, and we'd eat. Of course, one time we had no meat or bread. That was a shame. It was at this point I asked the question, do you really think that was a meaningful time of prayer? Do you think that's how the first century churches prayed? Inevitably, there'd be a pause and an admission. No, it's more like a routine or ritual. They'd hardly qualify as a corporate prayer. In the, he calls it the New Testament sense. I like the first century. We're in the New Testament yet, in my mind. Then they would reflect. Their eyes would open. They remember those days when church members came together for powerful times of prayer. Some recalled 24-hour prayer emphasis the church had. Those good old days of prayer typically coincided, coincided with the best days of the church as at least the best of their recollection, recollection. Not coincidentally, prayer and the health of the church went hand in hand. What does Pastor Joe say about the least attended service at our church? It is what? Prayer meeting. Now you're meddling, Peterson. Get off my toes. When the church is engaged in meaningful prayer, it becomes both the cause and the result of greater church health. It was the first church, the Jerusalem church. Many had become Christians and began to gather in places at Jerusalem. Luke, in his eye for detail and historical accuracy, describes the early days of the church in Acts 2.42. I just read that, but I want you to listen to what Tom Rayner has to say, because I can't say it like he does. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayers. That's the Holman Christian Standard Bible version. We could spend volumes on this one verse, but note that what the early followers of Christ found important. The apostles' teaching, the word of God, Fellowship and breaking of bread, each other, and the prayers. Don't read qu too quickly past the word devoted. Uh, New King James says, um, steadfastly. 
The word has much intensity and deliberation. It's like a wild and hungry beast ready to attack, devour it, to devour, to devour its prey. When the early church, Jerusalem church members devoted themselves to prayer, they were doing a lot more than reading names off a list. They were fervent, intense, and passionate about prayer. They had no doubt that God was listening and responding. Do I pray like that? A failure to pray was tantamount to a failure to breathe. Prayer was not an add-on to give permission to them to eat a meal. It was serious stuff for a serious group of church members. Prayer was the lifeblood of the early church. He paused when I asked the same questions. There was no different than the others who had graciously given other time for these autopsies. He, this is a member of a deceased church, did not have a ready answer for the questions. Do you think this is a meaningful time of prayer? Do you think that's how the New Testament church is prayed? After a short pause, he said something very telling. There was a day when prayer was powerful in our church. People would pray before the worship services. Small groups spent a lot of time in prayer. They prayed intensely for our community. Then he stopped. It was like a light went on. Then our community started changing. He spoke methodically and slowly. We were afraid. Many members sold their homes and got out as quickly as they could. They started focusing on the fear. We stopped serving our community. And he says, and tears welled up in his eyes. He started again, and we stopped praying with the passion we once had. That's it. It was the beginning of the decline that led to our death. We stopped taking prayer seriously, and the church started dying. No prayer, no hope, and the church started dying. Time of transition. Is it a mystery? What's going to happen next? Suspense? The unknown? Fear? Excitement? What are your prayers like? Very interesting in my Sunday, my Sunday school class. The Sunday school class that's attended last week are similar to our prayers. We have a lot of physical needs. I want you to just think for a little bit. Okay, let's, let's Dan Fuchs uh, was listed in our prayer letter. Uh, his wife is Laura. That's Judy's sister. Their daughter is Ellie. Dan was a school teacher. Isaiah had him for a teacher. There's a man who has a brain tumor. This is physical. But does this not represent a spiritual opportunity for his family to see a Christian fight a battle courageously with the confidence of knowing where his eternity is and his destiny as Kevin Kerfeld would say if I live good if I die I win Kevin Kerfeld was a member here he had stage 4 lung cancer lived way longer than anyone expected to him to and he's gone to glory I think about the guys that we prayed with Dave <laughs> John Berner gone with the Lord Kevin Kerfeld, gone with the Lord. Jody Olson, gone with the Lord. You and I have some work to do here, brother. There is a physical need that there's a spiritual implication. Who lives in front of you? Are they saved? Who lives behind you? 
Are they saved? Who lives to the right? Who lives to the left? Are you praying for your neighbors? Spiritual prayer for spiritual reasons. Their, he their healing, yes, but more so that we have a sin-sick world that needs a savior and we are who God put us here to, to do that work. We need prayer. I think our church lacks a corporate prayer. I'm not condemning anyone. I think we need to gather. We gather at 8.45 in the morning on Sundays to pray. And if there is a time that we need to move to a bigger time, a longer time, great, let's do it. We have an annual meeting next week. Is that something we'll talk about? I don't know, but I think it's important that we think and seek the Lord in prayer on prayer and that we do pray. We must pray not to go back how we used to do it. But we need to go ahead with a fervency and intensity to see souls saved, to see Christians revived. Dead men walking. <laughs> I mean, you have to be revived. I mean, there's living and it has to be revived. Christians need to be revived. We need to see dedicated believers serving fully in and out of the church. To lift one another up and to hold one another accountable. I'm going to go to my favorite verse, James 5.16. I'm going to start with verse 13 to get the idea. I want you guys to count when you hear prayer or pray. James 5.13-16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil, in, with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. How many times? Did someone count for me? Five? Five? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. God is going to forgive us of our sins, but we may not be healed because we have guilt and shame. Christ died for our guilt and shame. If I have a brother, a sister in Christ that I can confess my sin to, confess your sins one to another, and you will be healed, I will be held accountable. Oh, Chuck, I just keep robbing banks. Can you pray for me? <laughs> And Chuck comes up and he says, did you rob a bank this week? I did. you got to stop that, Gene. This is a, a terrible exaggeration, but if he holds my feet to the fire, I'll stop robbing banks so I don't have to keep telling him that I'm doing this. That's probably a very, very poor illustration, but in our own flesh, we have a tendency to sin, and I'm not very proud to tell you what my sin is, but I could probably tell Chuck, and he would hold me accountable. And there would come a day where I take that sin that I struggle with and turn it into a ministry to help you. You go through what you went through to help others get through what you went through. That's a paraphrase of Corinthians somewhere. <clears throat> this is Zechariah 4, 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my but by, by my spirit, says the Lord. Spirit, Pui. Should I try that again? <laughs> Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. One more verse here in Acts 4. <clears throat> Peter and John go to the temple. They heal a man. There's trials, there's imprisonment, all this. And they... They, they say, um, uh, that, okay, verse 27, for truly against, this is verse four, chapter 4, verse 27, for truly against your holy servant, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people, were gathered together to do whatever your hand 
and purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats. This is a, grant, a prayer. Uh, this is after they've been released. It's a prayer for boldness. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that all boldness may, may speak, that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and the signs of wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I want to live to see the day where this church is shaken because of the prayer of God, because the Spirit is here. I remember one time saying, not on my watch will this church close, and I'm afraid that without prayer, we need, we need to be praying that we can be a thriving, lively, spirit-filled church that would bring others to Christ and bring him glory. I'm going to call the worship team forward, and then uh, I'll pray, and we'll have a song, and then there's some announcements after that. Thank you. Isaiah, my son, talked about a professor who would be asked to, to uh, speak somewhere and they would give him a topic and he says, no, I'll give you what's on my grill. <laughs> this has been on my grill ever since Wednesday night before the first that uh, we found out that Pastor DeVitro was resigning. And... Um, I desire to see God move here. And it's going to be through prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we could come together. Help us to probe our hearts and to find that passion to pray. And that we would be bold as Jehoshaphat in a sense, calling God to task. Are you not the God who? Are you not the God who? Are you not the God who? And this is how they repay us. And he delivered them. And then the first century church was totally sold out to prayer. And that we should be the same. Pray, Father, that your word would impact our lives, that we would change, and that we would know that it's not by power or might, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.